As fun it is to cover day-to-day -day politics here, I, of course, have my eye constantly on what I consider to be a more interesting and possibly more consequential story for us all. That is the ongoing campaign and effort by establishment media operatives to quash and ostracize their competition now that they are entering the post-Trump age. Now, one of Trump's most revealing comments that he often made during his time in office was that many in the mainstream media would be screwed after he left because nobody would want to watch. Love him, hate him, that is unambig unambiguously true. And now that he's gone, some of the very people in the mainstream media are beginning to admit it. Chief among them was actually someone I mentioned yesterday, outgoing Washington Post editor Marty Baron, who gave an exit interview to his own paper and was asked whether the paper would have been successful in picking up subscription revenues without the Trump presidency. He replied, quote, would we have generated the subscriptions we did without Donald Trump? Probably not, to be honest. He adds, but I think it's largely now a result of people recognizing that there needs to be a vigorous press in this country. Ha! <laughs> Marty, don't fool yourself, man. That was disproven literally the day after that interview when the Washington Post journalist Sung Min Kim was hounded by resistance liberals and Washington Post subscribers for daring to ask Senator Lisa Murkowski about a tweet that Neera Tanden sent about her. Their subscribers don't want a vigorous press. They want to be spoon-fed, and the Post and the Times are guilty of pandering to them for profits in the short term with immense, long-term, massive damage to their brand. And as with all dying guilds, like modern journalism today, when you can't beat your competition, what do you do? You try to destroy them using your organs of power which is what we saw recently with an extremely revealing comment from journalism professor Sarah Roberts of UCLA. Roberts wrote on Twitter, quote, Substack is a dangerous direct threat to traditional media, but more importantly, it is a threat to journalism. Oh man, okay, here we go. What's her argument? Basically, journalists have to come up in newsrooms in order to learn how to be a real reporter and how substack means they won't have checks on their writing or behavior like before that the incentives of subscription will push them to churn out opinions only their audience wants to hear hmm well uh what did marty baron quote did i show you yeah that's right the Post editor himself admitting that he never would have hit their subscriptions without the Trump presidency. Here's the truth. The Post and the New York Times are in the same game as the Substackers. Sure, the Post and the Times, they have foreign bureaus, but their bread and butter is a reporting core which is tasked with serving as elite liberal enforcers who must protect their own power and the power of their subscribers at all costs. Ben Smith of the New York Times already gave away the fate of his own paper in one of his most recent columns, writing, The Times' unique position at the so-called paper record may not be sustainable because, quote, this intense attention combined with a thriving digital subscription business that makes the company more beholden to the views of left-leaning subscribers may yet push it into a narrower and more left-wing political lane as a kind of American version of The Guardian. That's it right there, folks. And the incident Ben was writing about is in column is exactly why. We covered it here before, the story of Donald McNeil. He's a former New York Times reporter who led a trip to Peru for a bunch of rich high school kids two years ago, where he was forced to chaperone these privileged brats and got into an argument with a woke white high school student about European colonialism. He ended up using the N-word in the context of dismantling a quasi-white man's burden argument that she was making about speaking up for people she clearly has no connection or understanding of. And after a tremendous brouhaha, he was fired by the New York Times, despite their own admission that McNeil used the word in context of history, not as a racial slur. They can enjoy the standards that they've set here from them for them from here on out. But what I find more interesting is Donald McNeil's own response to the incident. He was largely silent throughout this entire ordeal. More recently, he has penned a multi-thousand word response to the entire thing on Medium, where he opens with something that should chill all of you. McNeil says he is publishing his thoughts on Medium because, quote, I know journalists, we make America what it is, without a free press, democracy dies. 
but we're still jackals. We can befriend you, befriend you for years and then bite your arm off just as you're offering us a treat. We can't help it. It's the nature of the job. McNeil continues that since the reporting around the incident, he's been a jackal surrounded by jackals and that he can't trust journalists to accurately tell his side of the story. Sit and consider how remarkable of a statement that is. Here we have a former star New York Times reporter. He's worked in journalism for 50 years, openly saying, if you want your piece to be heard, you better just speak out yourself because the interlocutors cannot be trusted. A man who worked at the so-called paper of record chose not to give his side of the story to other reporters, but instead to fully publish his entire extraordinary account on a blogging website. That, if anything, is indicative of what the real problem with journalism today, it's journalists themselves who are rigidly ideological and whose work for companies which pretend to be neutral and who have gotten rich peddling partisanship to a powerful and very specific audience that expects total compliance. It's no wonder that Substack is booming or places like this show. People are sick of it and the empowerment of a culture that kicks out Donald McNeil while Nicole Hannah-Jones runs the show at the New York Times is exactly why. Be on the further lookout in the future for more threads from journalism so-called professors and other guild enforcers to quash competition. And remember, they're simply reaping what they have sown. We'll have more Rising for everybody right after this.